In this lecture, I'm going to talk about qualitative and unobtrusive measurement. Qualitative research is any research that relies exclusively or primarily on qualitative measures. We use qualitative measures for a number of reasons. We use it to generate new theories or hypotheses. We use it to achieve a deeper understanding of an issue. We also use it to develop detailed stories to describe a phenomenon, for instance. In many ways, qualitative research is at the heart of many inductive reasoning processes, where we begin with observations, then look for patterns, come up with tentative hypotheses, and then end up with a theory. That said, some researchers use qualitative approaches deductively, where they begin with a theory, generate hypotheses, look for observations, and in this case, the observations that they look at are generally recorded using qualitative standards. So for instance, they would record the words, photographs, graphics, pictures, and such qualitative measures. In some ways, qualitative and quantitative data are rather similar. Qualitative data consists of words, quantitative data consists of numbers. Now, when I say words, I mean rich words. So this could be rich sentences, which is a accumulation of words. It could be photographs, which is a descriptor or a visual descriptor of words. Quantitative data, on the other hand, is pretty lean. What I mean by lean here is they're just numbers. They're very simple. If I give you the number one, the number one means one. If I give you the number two, the number two means two. It's pretty lean. The amount of information that's in it is very clear. But all said, qualitative data can be quantitatively coded. So you can look at the number of words. So for instance, you can look at the number of times the word God appears on the Bible and count the references to God. And that becomes a conversion of a qualitative religious text, in this case, into a quantitative metric. You can look at the word God and the proximity to another word. So for instance, God uh, creates. And you can look at the time, the number of words create or creator or something you know analogous to creation appears next to the word God and then describe what the Bible's central theme is without having to read the entire text. So in this way you can take qualitative data and convert it to quantitative measures. You can do it the other way around too. You can take quantitative data and convert it to a qualitative judgment. And this is essentially what we do when we use a scale. A scale an item on a scale, for instance, is nothing more than a qualitative judgment that you ask a person to define using a quantitative metric. In this case, the metric is your response scale. So if I tell you, how happy are you, or how, do you, how well do you think Hillary Clinton is performing in, you know, how well did Hillary Clinton perform as the Secretary of State? This is a qualitative statement, and I'm giving you a scale of one to five, let's say. One being, you know, horrible, and five being excellent. Now, what I asked you to do is give your qualitative judgment using a quantitative scale. Qualitative data, in general, includes any information that can be ca captured that is not numerical in nature. As I already said, this could be, you know, the in-depth interviews of individuals and groups. This could, be com this could come from direct observations, where the respondent is not queried, but you're just observing them. These observations could be direct. They could also be indirect. Right? So you can have a camera and indirectly observe people, uh, such as what Wegmans does when they have cameras that look to see how people are shopping. So you get shopping patterns without querying people. You can do a focus group one-on-one -on -one to understand how people are actually doing the shopping. And you can also have written documents. So you can look at existing documents. Uh, it could be answers to an open-ended question in a survey about how do you shop at Wegmans. It could be historical data, people complaints that people write uh, as in, in letters to, let's say, Wegmans. So qualitative data could be a whole lot of different units of analysis. There are many different qualitative traditions of research, some of which we need to know. Uh, the first one is grounded theory. Grounded theory is about developing theory about a phenomenon, right? Uh, this is usually rooted in observation. Right? It's an inductive process where we begin with observation and we try to come up with a theory. This is also considered bottom-up pro bottom processing. And if you look to, be, look to see what we talked about in Chapter 1 when we talked about deductive and inductive reasoning, you get an idea of what I mean by these constructs, concepts. Um, grounded theory is important 
the idea of grounded theory is to look at data, in this case, which data like words or photographs or behavioral themes, for instance, or recordings, and come up with a theory. Okay? The second approach of qualitative tradition is what is called as ethnography. Ethnography uh, is a method of describing a culture or society. Uh, this is primarily used in anthropological research. Uh, ethnography emphasizes the observation of details of everyday life as it naturally unfolds in the world. Right? It's sometimes also called naturalistic research. Right? This is a method of describing a culture or a society. So, for instance, people go and live in old uh, ancient societies if they can, tribal societies in the Amazon or in New Guinea, and try to understand how people deal with conflict, for instance. This is an example of ethnography. Another uh, tradition of re qualitative research, another qualitative tradition is what is called as phenomenology. Phenomenology, which is made of the word phenomenon and methodology, it's a school of thought that emphasizes people's subjective experiences and interpretations of the world. In this methodology, what we do is we try to immerse ourselves in a society in order to observe problems, issues, conditions from the subject's point of view. Right? This is a, a, a methodology that is used in social work uh, and in you know, anthropological research traditions where empathy and perspective becomes the key to understanding. Field research is where the researcher goes directly into a social phenomenon and observes it as completely as possible. Here the natural environment is the priority of the field researcher. There's no controls or experimental conditions so to speak of. All it is is immersing yourself directly or indirectly into the field, into a research environment when you're conducting the field study. Qualitative research methods include a whole lot of different methods. Is participant observation, where the, liter the, where the researcher literally becomes part of the observation. So for instance, you may be, if you want to study homeless people, one of the things you may do is you may walk the streets of a given area in order to understand and possibly get access to subjects for a future study perhaps, which may be quantitatively done. But in this case, you are you know, literally becoming part of the research environment. You could do direct observation. Direct observation is where you observe the behaviors of subjects instead of relying on what the subjects say about themselves, right? So for instance, you know, you may, uh, if you go down at the University at Buffalo down in Baldy, we have the Early Childhood Research Center where they have, and if you've noticed, there's a playground where you see children playing. And those are researchers who are actually studying child, children's interaction in playground during early adolescence. That's an example of direct observation. Other methodologies use unstructured and intensive interviewing where you can ask open-ended questions during interviews. The approach uses case studies. A case study is where um, you focus uh, on a specific element of some hard to understand phenomenon, a phenomenon that is probably relatively rare, a phenomenon that's not something that is very commonly observed. In these cases, case studies work really well. Uh, the business schools use case studies in order to put students, usually business students, if you're doing an MBA for instance, you know, we put students in contrived environments or we try to recreate a case uh, where a person might have to put strategic analysis into it. Likewise, uh, in the healthcare system, doctors are trained to study, for instance, diseases that are not very common anymore because you don't have that many uh, occurrences. Uh, and so you provide them with cases and help them to understand the exceptions when something is not very common in the marketplace. Outside of case studies, we also have other unobtrusive measures. This include indirect measures, or indirect measures where you collect the data without the participant being aware of it. This could be something as simple as putting a video camera, for instance, in Wegmans and observing people's shopping behavior uh, to something more complex, such as looking at people's social media posting habits. The problem in all of these is we have to be very careful about the fact that most people don't provide informed consent. Sometimes it's difficult to get informed consent, especially if you're out shopping at Wegmans and you don't even know there is a camera or the people who put the camera don't tell you they may be analyzing that data. There are issues of invasion of privacy and there's possibility of deception that we need to be careful about. This could involve secondary analysis of data. For instance, looking at retweeting data, Facebook posting data, right? These are or you can reanalyze quantitative data that someone else has collected. So you may combine multiple different data sets, and this can be used for replication or for more sophisticated analysis. Finally, 
I want to talk real quick about the strengths and weaknesses of qualitative research. Rather than go through everything that your textbook does a fantastic job covering, I'm just going to give you the Cliff Notes version of this. Quite simply, issues like internal validity, something we dealt with when it came to quantitative research data, gets converted to credibility when it comes to qualitative research. In other words, when we try to judge whether there are alternative explanations, we have to look to see the, cre the credibility of the data or the qualitative research data and the researcher when it comes to judging the quality of what the findings are. In the same way, external validity, which is your generalizability of quant quantitative research data, such as when you do a survey and you say, you know, are these findings generalizable to the larger market? gets converted to transferability, which is to what extent does, let's say, an observation at Wegmans transfer to all grocery stores, or do they only transfer to other Wegmans? Reliability, which is, you know, the dependency, gets the dependency of quantitative data, right? The consistency with which you get the same findings every time when you do, let's say, a survey, gets converted to dependability, which is, you know, how dependable is a particularly particular observed phenomenon? If you observe people, let's say, go and buy milk and eggs first or very often at Wegmans, is that a dependable enough phenomenon? Do we have enough data points? Do we have enough qualitative inputs in order for us to make that judgment? And finally, objectivity, something which is at the heart of quantitative research, gets converted to confirmability. In other words, if you were to do the study that we did at Wegmans at, let's say, a Whole Foods or a different store, to what extent can we confirm it? Now, overall, I've given you a very quick synopsis of qualitative research. Uh, I would like you to read the textbook to get more understanding, to get a clearer understanding of each of these individual research traditions and approaches. If you have any questions, please post your questions up on uh, the discussion board. Looking forward to it.